Pat Davin from Grinspoon, welcome to Australian Musicians. Thank you for having me. Uh, you guys going out on the road at the end of October playing uh, music from the Easy and New Detention albums, uh, celebrating the fact that these albums are coming out on vinyl for the first time on September 8. Um, are you a vinyl collector yourself? Uh, I am. Uh, not so much in the last few years, to be honest with you. Um, but when there was kind of the resurgence of vinyl, I was definitely... I got my old vinyls and um, dug them out from my parents' house, uh, got myself a record player and started buying some new vinyl. Um, not not as vivacious as some people, but I definitely do enjoy listening to music on vinyl um, for the obvious reasons that you kind of get to listen to a, an album in its entirety and it's not that kind of song by song that my children do, which is so annoying, you know, hey, Alexa, play this halfway through a song. It's another song. I'm like, Jesus, stop. Yeah. yeah. So once it was decided you guys were going to bring out these albums on vinyl, um, what's involved uh, from then? Well, we had to go, obviously, we're going to get the masters. Um, uh, that's always a can be problematic in itself, finding out where they are. Um, and then obviously get them, um, you know, to be honest with you, I actually don't really know. I think a lot of it had to do with, we were going to do a 20th, a New Detention um, was our biggest selling album. It was our most popular album. It spawned a lot of kind of, I guess, what our fans would call classic, classic Grinspoon tracks, uh, Chemical Heart, New Detention, uh, you know, Lost Control, you know, a thousand miles, et cetera. And we were just going to do a, a 20th anniversary tour. And then everyone, that would have been in 2022, but everyone knows what happened then. So there was no point in trying to do a tour. So in conjunction with the fact that we could actually release Easy and New Detention on vinyl at the same time, we thought it would be a great idea to kind of package them together and then do a tour where we do a long kind of a concert show where we showcase the be i guess the best of both those records we won't be i don't think we're going to be playing both the records in entirety because that would be far too much for our drummer <laughs> <laughs> so we're going to do some select cuts and um yeah and then hopefully people really enjoy listening to on vinyl i mean we're in sydney doing some rehearsals when we got them and phil and i went and found a record player and went and listened to them and it's such a great vibe you know what i mean i don't know you know, I couldn't A, B it to a CD, you know what I mean? I, and I haven't had that opportunity. But I just think it's that, you know, Grinspoon in a way have become a, a bit of a nostalgia act. We haven't released any new music for a while. And people come and see us because they want to, in a way, apart from the fact that they like the, like the music, they want to remember the, where they were in their lives, you know? It's like a little bit of a fountain of youth for people, you know what I mean? And so I think with the vinyl as well, it's another kind of facet to that prism that you can have this kind of stuff. And it's kind of cool. You know what I mean? Yeah. So Easy and New Detention were your second and third albums. Correct. Uh, what did you learn? Do you, do you remember if you learned anything from making the debut album that you took into those albums? Wow. Well, you know what I mean? Guide to Better Living was really a lot more successful than what anyone thought it was going to be. You know, like we're just a little band from Lismore. Sure, we got signed to Universal and we'd worked really hard to build up a live audience. I mean, we were two of dogs. We would we would do anything, you know. We were supporting every band locally and internationally that would have us. And, and we were going, because of the Triple J thing, we were getting we were a high rotation on Triple J then and Triple J was expanding out to, you know, regional areas and we did a lot of regional touring. And then when we went to make the album, it was kind of a surprise at how well it went. I mean, we knew that we'd, we'd, we'd kind of built something, a bit of a movement towards the band with our fans. But then when it came time to do Easy, and then, I'm oh, sorry, but just after that, we took off to the US for oh, basically two years trying to break it over there. We got signed over there. Um, we spent way too much time over there for probably for the band's own good, uh, trying to do it in the way that we did it in Australia, which is just playing every night, going through all these kind of different things. But, you know, when we got home from that experience, uh, it was time to do another record. We had a lot of songs, 
we didn't feel like we wanted to do the same thing again. But we got an American producer. We got Jonathan Burnside in. We thought that that was the right thing to do. And that was a good experience. Um, I guess we learned a lot about the recording process as well. You know what I mean? But it was also, you know, a somewhat tumultuous time for the band after being away for such a long time. And you kind of forget what your place is a little way in the kind of the music scene a little bit. Um, but then when we did the record, uh, it probably, we love it. I think it's probably one of the band's favourite albums, to be honest with you. Like we enjoy, we love the, love the songs. I loved listening to it the other night and it definitely brings back a lot of, a lot of great memories. But it probably didn't perform as well as what was expected considering the success of the album before. So I think the biggest change probably came when we went to do New Detention. Um, we did a lot of demos for that record. I mean, I think there was, there could have been 50 songs that we put forward for that album. Like we worked really hard. And in the end, when we delivered all the demos, the record company, our a and guy at the time came back to us and said, I still don't think you've got a strong enough album. And we were like, oh, fuck you, come on, let's just fucking make this thing. So Phil and I went into Stage Door in Sydney, just a rehearsal studio, and we we punched out Chemical Heart and Lost Control, and I think there was one other song that made the album. So his wisdom was probably correct. I think the pressure really built up on us to try and do something that was going to be maybe special for the band. And then we went back to our roots, you know. We went back to the guy who produced um, Guide to Better Living, Phil McKellar. Uh, we did it locally with, a, you know, we did it at Mangrove Mountain, which is, you know, just out of Sydney. We are all in, in Sydney at the time. And we just did something that we felt was felt really right. There didn't seem to be that kind of same pressure. And there you go, our biggest selling album to date. <laughs> um, you're taking out a few bands on this tour uh, as support, Private Function, Cupid and the Stupids and Press Club. Um, yes. What were Grinspoon's first major supports and what are your memories of those tours? The Screaming, the Screaming Jets was our first major support. And they would make us supply two loaders, which was our drummer and a mate of ours named Tim, who we took on the road with us, who had no idea. He just had like a mad amphetamine addiction. And so he would do it. And uh, he would kind of do our lights. And um, we used their front of house guy. And it was it was an amazing experience. I mean, it was hell, you know what I mean, in a, in a lot of ways. But the Jets were very good to us in regards to they gave us a lot of gigs. Like they would pay it. They paid us overs. I think they paid us 500 bucks a show, which we probably weren't worth at the time. And we saved and saved all that money. We'd done a, we'd done a debut EP, a green EP. And then we saved all that money and we, we just kind of squirreled away and we finally had enough money. We were unsigned and we went in, we got in contact with Phil McKellar who had recorded for us for the first Triple J on Earth. And we said, would you be willing to record an EP for us? And then he was like, yeah. And we went into the ABC in Sydney, all because of the Screaming Jets, mind you, and recorded our second EP. Oh, my God. The names just slipped my mind. I can't believe it. Anyway, on the back of that EP, which had Champion on it and um, a couple of other bangers, we got signed to Universal. We found new management. And um, the rest is history. But, I mean, Def FX, who else? Um, far out. The list is long and sordid, really. Dub war, inter as far as internationals. I mean, there were some great experiences there. We, we still talk about some of the things some of those bands said to us. You know what I mean? Jamie Fonty from Def FX came to us one night above the Cambridge Hotel in Newcastle. He kind of sidled into our, our what was probably the, the, jam, the, the, like the cleaning closet. Was put his arm on the wall and said, guys, this is your first band. You're going to be in a lot of bands after this, all right? Just take this as an experience. <laughs> Sean Fonty. It was Sean Fonty, not Jamie. Got to get the name right. Yeah. Um, what about the stage rig for this tour? Are you fussy about going back and uh, replicating the exact sounds? Oh, I'm on a camper these days, mate, so I can replicate them perfectly. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm on a camper. Yeah, I'm sure you know what a camper is. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So yeah. You've got to do a bit of uh, programming beforehand? Well, I've got a studio uh, in Byron Bay, and I work with a guy named Jordan Power, who's a really good engineer, and I've got a, quite a collection of old amps. I've got all those amps that I used on those tours and those albums. I've never sold anything. I've just bought more shit, to be honest with you. Um, so we went in, we profiled all of my amps. On the latest tours, yeah, I go song by song. I mean... I was taking out three 
vintage sun heads, you know what I mean, and three quad boxes. I mean, our freight bills were coming back and it was hardly worth going on tour. You know what I mean? I'd have them stacked like a quad box, three heads, and then two quad boxes the other side, like a big fuck off screaming square. Um, And then I thought about Kemper and I did a lot of uh, investigation into it and I talked to Jordan about it and then... We went in and we got a Kemper stage through Kemper. They they kindly lent me one just to, ha- to have a look. And um, we profiled a lot of the amps. And to be honest with you, when we're sitting in the studio and we're A being the natural sound of the amp to the Kemper, you can hear it, but it's so minimal. You know what I mean? Like nobody would give a fuck, to be honest with you. Least of all me, really. Like if I can pack my rig up in a suitcase and walk off <laughs> on stage... Nowadays, uh, I'm a happy man. Uh, um, Fenver are bringing back the uh, Sun Amp uh, name. They've, are they? They've acquired the name, yeah. Um, and you, I think you had, was it three Sun Amps you were running at one point? Three. All, all, 300 watt Suns all are slaved together. Yeah. Was it, was it a Hendrix thing? Is that how, why you got into them? Johnny Ramone, actually, is why I like the look of that setup. Um, not necessarily the Suns itself. Um, the Suns itself, I just, man, I just love them. And you know what? My cr- our crew loves them because you could drop those things off a, off a fucking 20-storey building and they would fire up every night and work. They were absolutely bulletproof. I've still got the three of them in my studio. And I, I pull them out every now. Well, I obviously modelled them for, for the Kemper and all that kind of stuff. And they're just absolutely bulletproof. You know what? I bought two of them. Um, then the, that, the, whoever was doing it at the time closed it down. They sent me another one of dead stock, you know what I mean? Because they knew that I loved them. And um, they were all, you know, they were always a great. Um, they, they, were, they, they were just great, you know what I mean? I, I loved them. But the actual look that I took onto stage was the Johnny Ramone three heads on the one quad and then the two quads the other side. That's where I got that from. Yeah. Um, what about guitars? How many, how many guitars are you taking out on the road with you? Um, at the moment, I've got a white 70s Les Paul Custom. I've got an R6 Gold Top. Um, I've got a Memphis Build 335. I've got an old Tele. And I've actually got a Tele Custom that I did a bunch of Keith Richards style mods on. I moved the... Um, the selector switch down. I, I made a master tone. Moved the selector switch down to where the tone pot was. So my so my selector switch is down where my volume and tone pots are, and put a little coin over the hole where it was up near the near the horn. And um, yeah, it's got a, a Fender have now got the wide range. The actual they were using the Alnico two, which was the closest magnet for the wide range pickup, but they hadn't actually produced what the actual wide range pickup was originally until the last couple of years. So I got one of those. And I popped it in there. And at home, to be honest, at home, I've got a 62 SG. And I'm thinking about taking, just borrowing the path out of the front of that and possibly putting it into the Tele Custom. Very nice. Um, Is that enough info for you? (laughs) (laughs) Um, You say you've kept most of your gear. Is there any regret gear, stuff that got away? Man, I'm being really honest with you here. I've pretty much kept everything. I've got some, some yeah, I've got some pretty amazing stuff. Like I, I, I sold a couple. You know, you probably I don't know if you know, but I was sponsored by Mayton for a while there, and they used to send me a lot of guitars. And I probably, I've still got quite a few of them, but they kind of sent me a prototype of the whole hollow body Josh Home one, the MS twelve hundred, I think it was called, and I don't know where that's gone. So I don't know if I lost it in a card game or gave it to someone when I was drunk, but I can't find it. I was like, someone asked to borrow it. Um, And I was like, yeah, I got one of those. And so I went to my lockup and I couldn't find it. So I definitely, that's, that's something that I, I would really, I hope I haven't lost because um, it was a prototype of one of those guitars and they're nice guitars. Yeah. Uh, what about sound check? Is that important to the band? You spend a lot of time. Yeah, we, we do. I mean, we do, yeah. Um, uh, sound check is kind of, you know, yeah, it's really important to our crew as well, you know what I mean? Our crew, especially about front of house guys, very fastidious about sound and 
and uh, all that kind of stuff. And um, so we we try and give them the best opportunity to have the best show that they can possibly have. I mean, we're on ears now as well and um, on any monitoring. So with the camper, obviously, and all that kind of stuff. And especially for our drummer, he likes to feel very comfortable on any monitors. And as you know, they're not always the same. You can have your show file and have what you've had for the last two nights. And it sounded great for the last two nights, but you can walk into a room and even on IEMs, you can you can have problems. So we definitely like to do that. The front of house guy monitors very important. And as far as you know, once we're rolling into a tour, you know, playing the songs and getting them tight is no longer a consideration. It's more about putting them. I mean, we always say, look, people pay good money to come and see our band. Now we don't want to. We want to give them the best show we possibly can. We want to have the right lights. We want to have the right kabukis. We want to have the. We want to have everything that people walk away and go, "Fuck, that was you know that was money well spent." I had a great night, and all of those things, including soundcheck, go into making sure that people feel like they're not getting ripped off. Yeah, um, something else you've been doing this year or earlier in the year, playing with Bernard Fanning's band. How did that come about? You guys go back away. A we do. I've been with Bernard for a while now. Um, yeah, kind of beginning of COVID. Well, funny, me and Bern, obviously, we've known each other for 25 years because of the game. Um, he moved to where I live about oh, eight years ago. And my daughter and his son were at school together. And I would see him across the kind of playground or a pickup and be like, yeah, yeah. And he'd kind of give me the nod or whatever. But then as we got to know each other, we realised that we had a lot more in common than we did differences, and we became really good friends. It just worked out that that um, he enjoyed playing with me, we enjoyed playing together, and the gig um, and the gig is mine now, and I love it. Um, another thing you did last year was the, uh, the Lismore Floods uh, benefit gig. Uh, how, was that, how was that experience, and have you been back since? It was very wet and very muddy. And, yeah, I still live in the area, so and I've still got a lot of friends in Lismore, so I still spend a lot of time there. But it was great, you know what I mean? In hindsight, it would have might have been better to leave it till it was a little less muddy. <laughs> mm-hmm. But um, people didn't care. They just wanted to get out and have a good time. And PK, Paul Kelly played with Dan. And, um, yeah, you know, there was Shepard. There was a lot of great artists on that day. We were just honoured to be there and honoured to close the show. Yeah. Um, you mentioned uh, we haven't seen a, a studio album from you guys for a long time. Um, <laughs> anything in the works? Oh, well, you know, we're a modern band. You know, we have a, a Dropbox where people put um, music into if they've got any ideas that they think would be good for Grinspoon. Um, We really have been focusing on this kind of nostalgia stuff for quite a while now. But I think the time is getting closer and the songs are getting are, get, are getting there that we could definitely have an opportunity. I mean, we'd have to go to maybe Universal and say, do you want to do you want to give us bastards another go and see what they say? And, and who knows? I mean, we're definitely open to the idea. I think we've just got to get through this next tour. And then in after that, we'll probably go, what are we going to go next? And that's definitely have, going to have to be an option that we're going to have to consider if we feel like, we're going to do something good enough because there's no point in releasing music just for the sake of it. Yeah. Um, so this tour goes through to the end of uh, 2023, pretty much. Um, yes. Album ideas aside, uh, what else is happening for 2024? 2024. Well, I'll probably have a bit of BF stuff, I would imagine, uh, floating around. Um I think that we're just kind of playing by year. I think we've got some festival dates through the new year. We've got to, we've got obviously we've got a, a couple of corporate things for, for New Year's and and after the, and after that. I think the we finish up around March. The tour goes till the end of kind of end of December, but we kind of finish all our commitments in March. And after that, we will have to look at our what are we going to do next? Your guess is as good as mine, Greg. I really actually don't know. Yeah. All right, Pat, uh, it's been great to chat and we look forward to seeing you out on the road. Thanks, Greg. Appreciate your time, mate.